And go blue, everybody. The quest to Atlanta, next on Michigan Wolverines Live. And welcome to another episode of Michigan Wolverines Live. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. My name is John Diadamo, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so. Um, so thanks, everybody, for coming. My Twix is at John Diadamo. Uh, I do host this show as well as a show called The Ocho, which will be coming back next Monday, I promise. Um, you are going to see a link. Uh, our I'm asking our moderators to please continue to post it to City Dogs Rescue and City Kitties. We will discuss that at the end of the show. Um, so we get through all the news because we have a lot to talk about. Um, but please consider great organization, um, you know, that helped me find Gizmo. Um, and we will talk about that at the end of the show. But we have a lot of news to cover. So before we get to our panel, because we do have a, a two guests today, um, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. If you haven't shared with a friend, do it. Put it in a Discord chat. Put it in a, a Facebook group. Just copy-paste the YouTube link out there. And if you want inspiration, just do what Jackson Johnson does, otherwise known as Double J. Uh, great guy, and he's posting our stuff all over the place. So if you want inspiration, just do what Jackson does, all right? Um, so like also subscribe because we are we are building at a higher clip than Ohio State, but Ohio State's still about 1,200 subscribers ahead of us. What are you doing to beat Ohio State today? Maybe it can be subscribing to Michigan football at the voice of college football. Um, the Texas channel is coming. Don't mess with Texas. And uh, is anybody here messing with Texas? I, I hope not. I hope not. We're going to give them all the respect because we face them in September. Um, the launch party to that, uh, to that channel is coming. The relaunch, I should say. Monday, April 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern, which is going to make tax day a little bit more, a little bit less shitty. Um, so that'll be on the main channel as well as the Texas channel. Um, and Mark will be there. Uh, we have we have a couple others, Sonny Varma and, um, and Matt Miller, who has been hosting our Texas stuff, um, will all be part of that. So tell a friend, even if you don't care about Texas, you know what? Let's support them anyway. Um, and it'll be right before the Ocho, which will be great. Um, and I'll, I'll start the Ocho once this is done. I'm going to give them the respect to have their, their, their party. And then I'll go, I'll go live after uh, the launch party. And finally, send us a super chat uh, if you want your comment or question to the top of the screen. Um, we do appreciate super chats. Uh, and we'll get to one in just a second, actually, from last week. But uh, joining us again are uh, we've got TJ from uh, from Ronan Sports Talk. TJ, thanks for helping me hold down the fort uh, last week when I was in Vegas. Uh, you guys did a fantastic job. Yeah, no problem, John. It's always a pleasure to be on the show, and uh, it's always good talking with Mark. Absolutely. And uh, who else helped me with that is Ferris Khan. Uh, uh at, at which you can find uh, at bob bobblehead guru uh ferris go blue welcome back go blue uh it's uh real tough news about about your dogs i just wanted to kind of thank you publicly uh state that uh, uh thank you Mo, um you know that that's real tough H hope you're getting through it okay you know, I got family, I got everything, uh, you know, and, and a, a pretty busy career. And, and so that's all keeping me pretty busy uh, through this, luckily. And there, you know, the, my mom and brother are literally 10 minutes, 15 minutes. In fact, my mom might actually be on in the chat right now. Uh, so we really appreciate that. Um, as is every, as is Moose, who's here. And Moose had a tough loss of his own. Um, you know, he lost his, his dad. Uh, recently. Um, and uh, so on the After Dark show on Sunday night, there was uh, there were some kind words about both his dad who passed as well as Gizmo. Um, and uh, so so our community rocks. I mean, they, they really do. Like, thank you. Thank you, guys. Everybody in chat 
who said a nice thing or people who were in on the panel Sunday night who said nice things. Um, you guys are awesome. Really, really appreciate it. Um, okay. We have a lot of news to get to before we get to the, we'll, we'll have a, a, a couple, I'll be saying some words at the end of the show. Uh, but we have a lot to get to. Um, this excited me y'all. Uh, you know, I got excited about the beat Georgia drill last year. Cause it, it just kind of felt, I know a lot of people made fun of it, but I was like, no, this is like the intensity and focus on the off season that we, or the post season that we needed. Um, and I like that this is continuing with now what's called the quest to Atlanta drill and all Ben Bredesen would, uh, would say on it, um, was really just, Hey, it's physical practices. It's one-on-ones you're practicing against guys who could, who could, uh, you know, be, be the guys you play during the season. It just helps everyone get better. So I'd say it, uh, it's as physical as it's ever been. Um, so with this backdrop, um, how could, can Michigan actually do this? Can Michigan actually have that quest to Atlanta and get to the national championship and win the national championship? Uh, TJ, we'll start with you and kind of what your, what your initial thoughts were when you heard about this quest to Atlanta drill and the mentality that they have right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, when I first heard about it, I thought, you know, obviously we saw this with the beat Ohio drill, the, you know, beat Georgia drill. So this is another variation. And uh, what I love about it is it sets a destination for the journey, right? So they're, they're setting a destination every season for the journey that they're taking, which they're now in spring practice. So, I mean, you love to see it. It's good to see uh, some old uh, tactics uh, transitioning to the new coaching staff. So I do like that. What do we need to do to achieve this, right? I mean, the defense is there. I think we all agree. We have an elite defense. It's probably going to be top 10, if not top five. Um, very, very good defense. The concern is, is the offense able to get us there? Now, the playoff is going to be expanded this year, right? So we got a 12-team playoff. I think as the team stands now, we are a playoff team. Okay, so then it, it comes down to seeding. But we have an April portal. If if jobs or battles are not won to the uh, to the level that the coaching staff wants to see in terms of wide receiver, in terms of quarterback, um, possibly other positions, which we'll probably get into later. But uh, I think if certain positions are filled, I don't see why we can't take another run at another national title. I don't. I, I don't. I think our team is literally a quarterback and a wide receiver away now, in my opinion. Yeah, quarterback and wide receiver are definitely the the two que- two key question marks. Uh, Ferris, uh, you know, what was your kind of initial thought of, of the yeah. mentality? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, here, here's how I look at it. Um, yeah. There are probably, you, you don't take anything for granted, but, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, we're going to win nine games and then there are three games, um, you know, uh, where uh, Texas, Oregon and Ohio State, where um, Let's say let's take a really pessimistic view. Okay, let, let's let's take optimistic that we're going to win the nine ga- the other nine games. Okay, now we've got three games. Let's say we only have a one in three chance at each of those mm-hmm. games. Well, one in three plus one in three plus one in three. If you take you do all the math there, um, the probability is actually greater than 50-50 that that we go ahead and um, at least win one of those three games. You win one of those three games, you have two losses. Yeah. If you have two losses, I think you're in the playoff uh, yeah. with, with Michigan's schedule, right? So then you have to have a mentality of it. It's more like an it's more like a basketball tournament than it is. It's closer to a basketball tournament than it is a um uh you know uh one game, then you're in the final game kind of thing, right? So so I think the template actually might be Alabama from last year, mm-hmm. where they were kind of in disarray. They lost to Texas to sort of, you know, um, Milrow kind of had to win the starting job back. And then yeah. all of a sudden they gelled. And by the end of the year, they were a much better team right. than at the beginning. I think that might be kind of the template uh, uh, to kind of follow. The good news is there is no... Um, you know, it, 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 we should not be expecting perfection and it doesn't even matter. You know, two, two right. losses, I think we're still in. So I agree. 
Yeah. Yeah. Two losses is like, I, I have my prediction right now at 10 and two. Um, I think there's, there's two drops in here somewhere. It might be Texas and Oregon. It might be Ohio state and somebody, it might be USC sneaks in there and, and gets one. Um, if they can figure their defense out quick enough, uh, for that game, it's, it's going to be tough with a new defensive mm -hmm. philosophy, I think for them to beat the elite, uh, teams in the big 10, but with the offense and Miller Moss, uh, what I saw in the bowl game, I don't think it's impossible to consider the, that that could happen. Um, so I could see it be 10 and two. And then uh, those those losses are either going to be Texas, uh, Oregon or Ohio State would be my guess. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised, like I said, if someone like a USC sneaks in there. Um, you know, it's a tough schedule, but don't, don't forget Penn not State. the toughest. I would say Penn State as well. Uh, Penn State I don't think we're playing. Play we're, I don't think, yeah. We don't got Penn State next year. No, no Penn State. Yeah, so they could, they could. Well, I'm, I'm saying we don't lose, but they yeah. could kind of sneak, um, sneak past us, so to speak. We, we have to kind oh, of. Oh, in the if it's nine and three. Yeah, in the nine I, and three kind of range. So, so we got to worry yeah. about uh, about that as well, right? So, um, it, 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 it could get really interesting if Michigan, Ohio State, OSU all go one and one against the other two. Penn State maybe just loses one game, uh, or USC pick one of those two, and then and then what? You know, it's going to be, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, p potentially j just kind of a hypothetical here that I thought about. Uh, if you have three teams, you know, pick the three teams uh, that are in the top eight. Um, it's possible that the team that does not go to the Big Ten title game might have an easier path. Because they would have a buy by not having to play the Big Ten title game, and then if they're in the top eight, they get a home game with you know whatever mm. ten twelve million dollars worth of revenue or uh, you know just from that home game. So, um, you know that doesn't, might be an actually easier path potentially. So anyway, just a thought. <laughs> doesn't the top four get a home game, or does the top four get a buy? How's that work? Uh, yeah, top four gets a home game. The next yeah. four, I think, get a buy. Oh, I'm sorry. Top four gets a buy. The next four get a home yeah. game. Right. That, was, that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Moose, Moose saying, uh, I think Texas squeaks by or Michigan squeaks by Texas. Um, I do want to quickly, uh, before we change, uh, we do want to honor, uh, give it, you know, since we're talking about drills and, um, you know, we had, there was also a beat Ohio drill and Nick, uh, Nick, Thank you for your dollar ninety nine super chat last week. Um, so, <laughs> U of M thirty. He is predicting U of M thirty eight, Ohio State seventeen. Go blue. Day is still soft. Um, sure. So so. Uh, hey, you, you heard it from Nick himself. Uh, thirty eight seventeen. Man. If that happens in Columbus, can you imagine the 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 amount of like just just mind blown Buckeye fans if that's the score? <laughs> but I yeah, mean, I mean, well, yeah, it, okay, it's it is optimistic, but I do see, think of it on the defensive side. Could Ohio State only score seventeen? I, I think with our defense, that's that's possible. You know, uh, offensively, do do we score thirty eight on them? I don't know about that, but. Uh, uh, we could be in the twenties. They could be in the teens. You know, I think that might be a real, realistic score. And once again, Ohio state is looking past. It's amazing. You know, it's been, um, 1,592 days or whatever it is, uh, since mm -hmm. Ohio state beat Michigan at football. And all of a yeah. sudden there, I call it like, you know, my kids, they had that little paper plate awards, you know, like they, they, they could design their own little paper plate, whatever. It, it's kind of like that. They've they've made a paper plate award for the off season. Yes, um, they have already declared themselves as better than Michigan. Yep, and they don't even have to worry about Michigan. Are they having Michigan drills like we're having Ohio State drills? I'm not sure that they're as serious about it. Uh, still, I, I so I, I I'm pretty optimistic about that game actually. Um, going back to the quest for to Atlanta and uh, and Alex Orgy because I I do think for for Michigan to uh, to take to 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 be at at that level, um, and I know we will be talking about the transfer quarterback uh, that may be coming later. Um, but 
Alex Orgy, I think, and thank you, Nick, for contributing last week. Sorry we didn't get to it. Um, so hopefully you saw that we just honored it. Um, we try to honor all Super Chats, but sometimes we're human. Things happen. Um, but uh, but Alex Orgy, I think he needs to be Jalen Milrow level, like, or at least in that universe. I see that as his comp, um, where he doesn't have to be the best passer ever, but his running ability covers, you know, uh, it covers up for some of the inconsistencies in the passing game. Um, Alex Orgy, I think, yeah, he's got to, he's got to step up, uh, you know, for, for this to work. Uh, uh, TJ, uh, any, any, any news on Alex Orgy? I have been hearing like first week went really well. Second week, a little more inconsistent. Yeah. So with the quarterback situation, uh, Alex Orgy has been, it's, you know, as Nick pointed out, he's been inconsistent, you know, he'll have his good days. He'll have his days where he's not as strong. He'll have throws where it looks amazing, and then he'll have throws where you're wondering where what happened, right? So the issue with Alex Orgy is the consistency right now. That's that's what Michigan is trying to overcome. Um, he has everything else. He has the arm strength. He has the understanding of the playbook. For the most part, obviously, it's a couple weeks in the spring game. But what, under, but what I'm getting at is he understands the scheme and the schematics of the playbook. He knows what Kirk Campbell's looking at. He's been with Kirk Campbell for over a year. Um you know, and he has obviously the running ability, which you can't teach, right? That's something you're born with, and he has it. So, and and he has the size, so he's gonna be hard to bring down, hard to tackle. So he has everything going for him. He's just lacking one thing, and it's consistency. So, if he can find consistency, I don't think we do portal shop. Uh, but if consistency remains an issue, they might bring in another quarterback for competition in the fall. And I think you know we're gonna that's gonna be. And that's going to be the telling thing, right? If they do add a quarterback uh, this April, this April portal, that'll give you the answer on how comfortable are they with Alex Orgy. If they get a, if they get a quarterback, obviously comfort's not there. If they don't get a quarterback, they're comfortable. So time will tell on that. Yeah, I mean, we've discussed this uh, uh, in the past. I, I, I believe right. that Orgy should. Um, I believe that uh, Michigan is set. Uh, you know, my thought is that Tuttle is the floor and that they can go up from there. So if they want the truly game manager and things aren't going right, <clears throat> you've got Tuttle to do that. Um, uh, you know, I talked, we talked about the, it was more of a hypothetical thing, the two quarterback system, you know, could that work? Um, I think in game one, maybe it's okay to do that because you do want to keep Texas guessing for game two. So, um, you know, or orgy, can he be J Jalen Milrow? I mean, Milrow had a higher uh, passing efficiency rating, according to sports reference, than J.J. McCarthy last year. So <clears throat> that's a super high bar. I, I don't think he he can do that. You know, my, my idea, I just put it in the chat, is orgy passes to tight ends for 10 yards. They get more 10 more yak yards and, you know, yards after catch. And that's the kind of thing that he's going to do. He's maybe he throws it up once or twice, tries to get a pass interference. Maybe he connects, but at least a threat is there to to spread out the um, the the defense. So um, I'm not looking for Milro uh, from Orgy if, if if he can be. Um, let's put it this way: if he can be game manager, but then he also runs and and does stuff off off script, that's good enough for me. So. Yep. Uh, so I think that the, the, like it's, it's, it's cautious optimism. I mean, I, I still think um, if he can get his passing up a little bit and he can, I I've been saying Cade level, I'm not even, I, I don't even expect it to be, uh, you know, anywhere close to JJ's universe, but if he can get his passing to a level, like we saw in last year's spring game, I know it was two passes. I get that very small sample size in last year's spring game. However, if we can replicate the medium range ball and the short range ball, and let's say it's 65% accuracy somewhere in that universe yeah, um, and his running ability, I feel like he's got to be the guy. Um, but we'll talk about some, about another potential option in a little bit here. Um, when you're doing your shopping on Amazon, as many of us do from time to time, uh, we have the link in every single video that we do at The Voice of College Football. Click that link uh, when you're doing your shopping on Amazon to 
uh, to help contribute to the voice of college football. Instead of Amazon getting all of the money, voice of college football gets a little bit of the money. Uh, so it helps our channel a lot. So consider doing that if you're already, if you've already decided you want to use Amazon. Um, so going into spring ball and some of, uh, what, what, uh, some of the quotes that have been coming out from spring practice and notoriously they are, they run a tight ship. There's all these rules about filming and, you know, what you can report on and everything else. So it's famously a very tight ship over there in Ann Arbor. However, um, we did hear, um, that the new Northwestern transfer, uh, O, o lineman Josh Preeb was praising the intensity of the Michigan practices. Uh, I guess maybe a departure from what he was used to at Northwestern. Um, so, are we seeing already the beginnings of Grant Newsom uh, shaping up to be a, a good replacement for Sharon Moore, uh, TJ? Yeah, I mean, I think it was probably the best hire we could make uh, given the circumstances of uh, Sharon Moore being promoted to head coach, right? So, um, I think Grant Newsom is a home run. I think he completely understands the scheme. He was formerly the tight end coach. Um, I think he's a, a very aggressive recruiter. And I think because he's also a former player, he can relate on the recruiting level better than almost anybody because he's lived it. So, yeah, Grant Newsom is the ideal replacement for Sharon Moore. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what this old line develops into this coming season. Yeah, I, uh, his football IQ and actual IQ in, <laughs> is through the roof from from all reports. Uh, right. uh, he he is um, uh, he was born in '97, so they see he, he's a very young guy. Uh, um, so I you know I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I think he was on the fast track. You know he he's already been on the fast track for a little while here uh, for at least. Uh, 18 months, maybe two years. So, um, uh, and he's right on that path. He's on that Sharon Moore path. Absolutely. Um, all right. So with that said, yeah, I, I do think, um, I do think, uh, it's, it's a good start. Um, I have been hearing that some of the linemen are getting a little bit banged up. I don't know how true that is. It's only like one source. Um, so we'll have to hear a couple more sources confirming that before we uh, make an official report on it. But, um, you know, uh, but intensity, usually a good thing. And Michigan has had a lot of success in this area being intense. Right. Um, and that's kind of what has separated Michigan a little bit from Ohio State in recent years um, as they go to more of a finesse and Michigan stays pretty uh physical but newsom did talk a uh, couple a little under a week ago about maintaining the standard uh that has been set by sharon moore coaching o-line and others and jim harbaugh uh who you can see is back here uh my my new my new uh painting uh with uh with jj and jim harbaugh is now officially here uh so uh so thanks to helen hayes art for that um, but, you know, talking about maintaining the standard that's been set. So um, so I, I don't really see any issues with the O-line uh, compared to other. I know it's an all new new unit, but but guys, a lot of them, as we know, uh, have been waiting in the wings for like three, four years. Like the, the, this is not their first rodeo. Right, TJ? Right. I mean, we have guys who've been in the pressure cooker for a long time. They also got a lot of depth snaps last season because we go, you know, we'll do six offensive linemen, seven offensive linemen. So a lot of them had reps, you know, guys like Giovanni Alhadi, Miles Hinton, um, even uh, Greg Crippen. So, you know, and by all accounts, uh, the guys have looked pretty good. I mean, obviously the defense, the defense is dominating and the defensive line is giving them fits, but you got to remember this is arguably possibly the number one, front seven in defense uh in the nation this coming season so uh they're going they got a tall task and uh you know i think uh we could see a, a, another consistent high level offensive line this next coming season i really do believe that yeah yeah if you, if you look through the numbers uh gentry played in seven games al hadi 11 uh Crippen, nine uh Priby, uh 12 hinton 14 so right. there is experience there. Uh, it's just that, 
we were the best of the best for three straight years. Are we going to do that a fourth year? I think it's natural to think there's going to be a little bit of a drop off. Um, uh, but but it's it's nowhere near the drop off, uh, let's say, versus the quarterback position for, you know, potentially, uh, you know, because of uh, how much we're losing versus the experience of the people who are coming back. Um, you know, Orgy yep. only had six games that he was actually in. And even when he was in, I mean, he was in very important games, but he was he wasn't passing and, and it was only for a couple plays here and there. So, um, you know, if, if I were to worry about one thing, it's much more about quarterback than the O-line. You know, O-line should be very, very good. It may not be the very best in college football like it was for the last three years. Absolutely. Um, and Rashad said exactly what I was thinking. Iron sharpens iron. And, uh, you know, that's been a t uh, what Jim Harbaugh used to say and just kind of the general philosophy. And um, apparently uh, Sharon Moore told Wink Martindale, throw the kitchen sink. Because the best way to grow as an offense is to face, you know, a national championship caliber defense. And, uh, and, and that's how they're going to grow and figure it out. Um, so a uh, quick reminder that the spring games are coming. So Ohio State will be putting on their show this Saturday, April 13th. And then next uh, Saturday, April 20th on Fox will be the Michigan spring game. So happy that these are finally being broadcast in a national stage where you don't have to find some side stream or some weird way to access it. Everybody's going to be able to see these. Joel Klatt's going to be there. Is, uh, I, I haven't heard about Gus, but I know Joel Klatt's going to be there. So, um, so that's very exciting. Okay, and Gus will be on the sidelines uh, eating popcorn and wearing a Michigan hat or something. There you go, just like the <laughs> basketball. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I know what you're putting down there. Um, join our Patreon or Discord. You can talk Wolverines all the time in our Discord chat. Um, on the main channel, you can become a YouTube member for as low as two dollars and ninety nine cents, and we appreciate that. Uh, so let's talk recruiting. And uh, we do have a super chat, so we're going to honor that uh, before we get to my topics uh, from Moose. So, Moose, thank you for taking taking some time out of what I know is a very difficult time in your life to come by and even give a super chat. So thank you for that. Um, do we have a shot? This is to TJ, but um, maybe maybe Ferris might have an idea as well. Um, he, he is asking about Elijah Menendez uh, from Miami. Um, so... Oh, this is actually a transfer portal, but it's fine. Um, so he's a linebacker. He's a linebacker um, at, at Miami. Do we do we think uh, that he might be a, an option? So he's actually a class of 25 prospect uh, out yep. of Miami. Um, he's committed to Miami, though. That's that's the thing about him. So, um, yeah. So what's oh, that's what it is. About, okay. Yeah, Got it. He's yeah, I was confused by looking. Yeah. So what's interesting about Elijah uh, Melendez is uh, – Typically, this type of recruitment is extremely difficult to pull because, one, he's from Florida, so that brings a yeah. challenge. Two, he's committed to NIL Happy Miami. So one that would tell you, okay, so the odds are low here. But apparently, uh, there's interest from Brian John marie and, and, and Elijah uh, Melendez. And what's really interesting about this recruitment is it was very warm prior to the coaching change, very warm. Like Michigan was actually the leader for the recruitment. And then after the coaching change, Elijah Melendez decided Miami was the place for him. So Brian John Marie has re-sparked this relationship, and he's actually visiting this weekend, and he's already set his official visit for June. So we're going to get two attempts to try and swing him back to us. And from insiders, they are a little optimistic, and not in the sense of getting a commitment, but the fact that this is gaining the traction that it's gaining – uh, it's something to watch. You know, I'm not going to say uh, it's a high probability, but the staff would not waste their time if they didn't feel like there was a door here to walk through. And so I think it's it's definitely an intriguing uh, recruitment to follow. Yeah, I'm seeing a, 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 it's a three day trip Saturday to Monday. <laughs> that, that's a long time. And then right. and then coming back on June 7th is, is what's being reported. So, um, yeah, both sides. Uh, why waste the time if, if this wasn't a high probability thing, you know, potentially a high probability, uh, you know, recruitment, right? So, 
Um, it's not just uh, window shopping, so to speak. I, I will add, though, if there is a concern, it's potentially that Melendez is using this as an NIL negotiation tactic with Miami to raise the price, which is happening uh, around college football where players are going to other schools to just for visits to try and raise their value. So, I mean, I guess it's something to be mindful of, but I don't think Michigan – actually, I'm, I know this. They cut those types of recruitments off very quickly. So if Michigan does feel like it's potentially that type of recruitment, then – they, they wouldn't pursue it much longer. That's why if anyone wants to know why Michigan doesn't pursue a player that shows some interest, there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons, potentially academically, potentially not a culture fit, but also the whole negotiation uh, uh, moving chairs is something Michigan doesn't want to play with. Yeah, that's a really interesting point and something we should kind of monitor uh, where we kind of look at the, um, the Michigan type of schools versus the, um, Texas A&M or LSU or whatever, you know, a, a other type of schools that are much more based on, or Miami, <laughs> uh, right. based on uh, highest bidder kind of thing, right? So. Yeah, definitely. And and so we do, so hopefully that answered as best we can, uh, Moose. Um, we do, we, we have been talking a little bit in the past about a uh, four-star wide receiver uh, Taz Williams. So I wanted to, to dive into to him a bit. It's always exciting when a uh, when a, a four star two four seven sports composite wide receiver. Even though he's five eleven, we do need to find some taller ones. I get that, um, but still very interesting uh, re uh, recruit. And uh, he has he, he it still says cool on here, um, but from uh, reports, it does look like. He is considering going to uh, Michigan and committing to Michigan for uh, 2025. So uh, I had this, I thought I had it queued up, but um, so th this guy, obviously, we, you know, Michigan is going to need uh, players like this in terms of, uh, in terms of like this type of, of impact playability here, um, being able to go from the X position, um, you know, and, and making things happen on the X position. Uh, making things happen in the Z position. Um, you know, he gives us the opportunity, uh, regardless of where it is, uh, he gives us the opportunity to, um, you know, to utilize him in different ways on, on the offense. Uh, you, you know, so, so while, while we're, we're watching this, I mean, uh, uh, you know, TJ, like, like, is that, a, is that, um, that that seems pretty positive that that a wide receiver at that level is uh is looking into to Michigan even though Michigan has that reputation of being the you know the running back you or the tight end you or the OL uh you but no um Taz Williams might be coming yeah that's right and a big selling point to a lot of receivers is the Roman Wilson effect so they mm. see what Roman Wilson did and they see how high he's projected to be drafted and they know and the coaches are also selling, listen, we need a guy. We need a guy that we can build around the offense. We need a guy who's going to get the ball and, and help push us, you know, to not, they don't want, they want to be more balanced. They don't just want to be a running offense, but you got to right. have the weapons to be that, right? So that's what they're telling these kids. The Taz Williams recruitment's actually trending very highly. I don't like to look at 247's temperature gauge because it's not updated all the time. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. not very reliable, but, um, you know, it's really a battle between us and Texas A&M. So what Taz Williams wants to do is he wants to finish his visits before he makes a decision. But, uh, you know, in Texas A&M, so we have another one here where it's a it's a highest bidder type of school, right? So we'll see. This is really going to be a nice test along with, you know, Eliza Melendez is, is Michigan's NIL competitive enough to land these types of kids who are looking at Miami, looking at Texas A&M, are we able to pull these guys? So we're going to find out, uh, you know, very, I'd say in the next few months, you know, how competitive it is. I mean, there is word that there are, there are kids on the team now making more money than they've ever made in, since NIL has started. The collectives are paying these kids far more money. There's far more opportunities. There's far more going on. They're not uh, getting like these signing bonuses, right? So, Word is they're, they're still not offering high school recruits upfront money. That's the right. word. But 
if you are a freshman. So this is where it's a little gray. And I'll be honest, I don't really like this approach because it's kind of the same thing, but it's not because it's not promised. But if you are a freshman like Jaden Davis, if anyone saw Jaden Davis's recent uh, Ford uh, or what was it? I forgot what dealership it was, whatever dealership it was. Well, he has a new vehicle and uh, uh, there are freshmen getting opportunities that were not getting opportunities previously. There is more money coming in now than there was previously. So, and they now can now present that. They can now present that to these high school recruits far better than they were able to prior. So we'll see if it's enough. We'll see if this step is um, going to get us to the point of being a consistent top 10 uh, recruiting class or not, but uh, in the next few weeks, it should be telling or next few months. It should be very telling in my opinion. Yeah, it was uh, it was Brighton Ford. So okay. our third string or fourth string quarterback has signed an NIL deal with Brighton Ford. So to your point, recruit for recruiting purposes, that's right. that's pretty cool. Uh, you Ferris, any any. Yeah, I would say before ever touching the field. Right. So, yeah. you know, it just goes to show you that things are working. Absolutely. Get on board with Brighton Ford. That's that's their uh, motto. So <laughs> I just know that from Sam Webb. The uh, the um, Roman Wilson effect. I, I, it, it's going to be uh, for those of you know. I, I think all of us are interested in the NFL draft. It'll be really interesting to see where Roman Wilson gets picked, and let's root for that to be as high of a round as possible because I think that's going to kind of show that you pay your dues. And even if you don't have the stats, so to speak, if you even if it's not super flashy, um, you may get a really good chance in the NFL, and and maybe that creates a pipeline. I think one other note I, w- I just want to kind of add is, uh, you know, Jim Harbaugh's motto of um, transformational instead of transactional. I think we probably need to be both. You know, there's there is a transactional yes. aspect to this that we're introducing. I hopefully that's what Sh- Sharon Moore is actually doing. So, um, you know, in a way, maybe he's the right person at the right time to say, "Hey, you know what? We're doing NIL, not the Jim Harbaugh way, but the Sharon Moore way." And there's going to be some quote unquote transactional stuff going on. You know, maybe leading to transformational. You know, keep players for multiple years or get some transfers. Ohio State fans and bloggers and um, <laughs> and and their YouTube is all about how you know Michigan has thirty year old players, which is not true. But but you know, uh, but but they're getting transfer. They're not you're, they're not developing players. They're getting transfers from other te- uh, other teams. I think actually that. That's a pretty sound, good strategy. Get a, get a captain on another team to come to your team, uh, and then get get that person paid, and uh, have have has a lot of, you know have that person have a lot of experience. So, um, really interesting dynamics. I mean, it, it, on offense for Michigan, every single position is potentially going to get drafted. Let's see. Let's see if it all happens. If all eleven, well, I mean, uh, there's six linemen, so. Whatever, eleven players are going to get uh, potentially drafted. It'll be really interesting to see where they go, and does that have kind of a halo effect for the next round of uh, players that want to pay their dues? So, uh, speaking of paying dues, this would be a way to do it. Uh, Minnesota Dave uh, recommending that if Taz Williams doesn't work out for being a wide receiver, maybe he could be a cornerback. So, Minnesota Dave uh, coming by Michigan Wolverines live. Yeah, uh, Taz probably wouldn't want to hear that. Uh, it's not, <laughs> no, it would not be in the recruiting pitch. But no. this is coming from a Minnesota Golden Gopher. This is, uh, for the record, if Taz is watching this or any of his people, not for me. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, but hey, look, we had success with Sanders still, right? And Marion Walker did do the transition, but it didn't stick. So, I mean, hey, you never know down the road, maybe, but you know, let's let's not sell it now. <laughs> well, come play two way. Let's 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 do a uh, Charles Woodson. <laughs> there we or go. Yeah, yeah, be yeah, be like Charles Woodson. Um, and then we do have a cor- speaking of cornerbacks, there is a an Ohio based uh, cornerback, uh, Dwayne Galloway, um, who is also has a crystal ball for uh, for Michigan twenty twenty five class. He's the fifth best prospect in the state of Ohio. 
um, and 96th overall, uh, runs a 10:42 in the 100 meter dash, um, and he's coming to take a visit to see Michigan football. Um, so, is it time for for Sharon Moore now with these types of people to start start getting signatures or start getting com- hard commits? Um, that's where we're hearing all this, but let's yeah. hear some hard commits. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dwayne Galloway is a big one. Uh, you know, by all accounts, he wants to come here. So we'll see. I, I know, from my understanding, what it is is it's a familiarity thing going on. They, Michigan wants to build the relationship. They want to. They want him to come in. They want to get to know him. They want to build the. Uh, you know the chemistry between the player before just take that's So that's another thing too. Like a lot of people might be like, well, why aren't guys committing? Why isn't this class building? And I am frustrated too, but I do understand this point. And the point is it's a new coaching staff. This new coaching staff has to get familiar with these prospects. And not only do they want to get familiar, obviously through phone calls and text messages, but they want to meet them. They want to get to know them. They don't just want these guys to sign. That's why you're seeing uh, not the rush of commits that, you know, you're seeing at other schools right now. It's because they want to get these guys on visits, get them familiar, and then start landing these guys. If we're not getting commitments by May, like at a faster rate, then then I'm going to start being concerned. Right now, I'm, I'm going to stay patient because, you know, the coaching staff just wants to get more familiar with these players. Like Dwayne Galloway, I believe we could have him now, but I know they want to meet him. So, it's just kind of where we are. And, you know, we can't be mad at it because this is how programs make mistakes. They bring players in and they leave a year later because they're not culture fits. Yeah, I completely agree with that, that statement. So um, h- how do you balance uh, being a culture fit, being a um, we want to transform you, transformational Michigan uh, from um, – uh, you know, getting somebody in that first year, and then you have to re, re- <laughs> then you have to go through the whole process again in a year. Uh, uh, if people leave, it's much better to kind of do it all at once and make sure there's a high probability that they'll stay. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. That's one of the things Michigan has going for it. Like the academic side of things makes kids not want to jump because some kids do realize, like a Quentin Johnson, for example, who's coming back. Uh, who was going to enter into the NFL, uh, you know, draft and all of these things. They realized the academic – that that's one thing that we have, though. Like, some schools just don't have that. So going jumping from degree to degree or school to school, it doesn't mean as much. But when you leave Michigan, it has a far greater impact on your long-term future if you are not an NFL player. And even if you are an NFL player, some careers don't last very long. So that's one uh, that's one of many advantages Michigan has. And, uh, you know, there is a balance to still be had, though, with the whole transactional transformational. And, you know, I think a school like Georgia, who's actually fairly high in academics, mm-hmm. I think that's maybe I don't want to say it's the model because it's extremely hard to to, to keep up with an SEC program. But something like a, a Notre Dame, along with the Georgia, they're able to maintain the transactional and transformational mm-hmm. Georgia, even though they have a speeding problem. Their players do not jump in the portal at the rate of other schools, you know, and that's that's kind of what Michigan needs to go for. Absolutely. Um, and Tony Alford is also cooking. Um, so it seems like uh, seems like one uh, one player, Jordan Davison, seventh best running back and 83rd best 2025 recruit. Um, did take a visit recently to uh, to hang out with uh, running backs coach Tony Alford and check out Ann Arbor, and it was his first visit since the first win over Ohio State in 2021 out of that three-win stretch there. So it's been a while since he's been on campus, but uh, Davison, Davison said uh, just being around the coaching staff, uh, they showed a lot of hospitality, one of the best relationships that I have with a coach, uh, about Alfred. And this is what we've been hearing, um, not just with this recruit, but with some of the others and some five stars, um, that they have a lot of great things to say about Tony Alfred. But now what we really want to hear is can, you know, nice things doesn't always equal as I've learned in business, nice things being said, doesn't always equal signatures and doesn't always equal, uh, the hard commit. So, um, 
So, so do we think that the uh, the impressions that Tony Alford is leaving on the uh, on the recruits if that 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 could uh, help bring people along, uh, TJ? Well, I, I think a hundred percent it's going to bear fruit. You know, I don't know about the Davidson uh, recruitment because you know where it is, Ohio State's kind of trending there. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, a guy like Marquise Davis, who was just up here, uh, who a lot of people are high on, you know, that could pay dividends. You know, I, I do think. You know, the, the beautiful thing about Alfred is he's an elephant hunter. He's a, he's a A-plus recruiter. I'm not concerned at all about the running back recruiting. You know, Michigan, the, this is where the scheme benefits us. Offensive linemen, running backs, tight ends, these positions, very beneficial. Um, I think we should have a pretty interesting running back class. I don't know if we're going to go for just one or if we're going to go for two yet. That I don't know if that's been decided, but uh, – yeah, I think we'll see a running back sooner than later in the class with uh, Tony Alford recruiting. Yeah, one interesting point, uh, even though they're supposed to be comparable schools, Ohio State and Michigan, uh, you know, Alford coming to Michigan, I think he thinks of it as an upgrade. Um, you know, we care about running more, running the football more. And um, I think that's also reflected in in running back recruits. I think the difficulties we might have in wide receiver and, you know, what we were talking about earlier, uh, we shouldn't have some of those difficulties on on the running back side uh, in terms of recruiting. Um, Let's see what we we can do. I mean, I, you know, my Intel on, you know, just kind of watching the, the Ohio state stuff is that, Oh, we didn't want Al Alford anyway. It was good that he, that he left. Uh, But I think for Michigan, the recruiting piece is something that I think is an upgrade for Michigan, uh, for sure. Yeah, just the recruiting pre- piece alone. And then I think Alfred does think of this as a um, a promotion because th- you know this is sixty plus percent of the offense is running. Yep. Versus Ohio State's much closer to fifty fifty. Yep. Absolutely. Um, when you, uh, you may have a college football fan in your life, uh, you know, friend, family, uh, relationship, whatever, uh, parents, um, well, consider getting some Mark Rogers voice of college football merch. And we do have, uh, on the merch store, a couple of items for Michigan football at the voice of college football. So you can cheers to our recent national championship, uh, get a hoodie. Um, you've got lots of stuff here. Um, you know, a couple of great items for, uh, for Michigan football. And then for the main, uh, channel, you've got top 25 that actually makes sense. Coffee mugs. Um, got some sayings in here now from Mark, uh, you know, uh, notebook and, and so on and so on. So, uh, so lots of great stuff here. Uh, consider checking out the voice of college football merch store. Okay. Uh, TJ uh, has a couple of kind of transfer portal candidates, um, given the fact that uh, that the portal does open in six days. Uh, so we're going to uh, first talk about the story of quarterback J.J. Cole from Ohio State or <laughs> Iowa State. Yeah, so this is a very intriguing situation. So there's some smoke here where uh... – so previously there was a relationship with JJ Cole in Michigan. Uh, Michigan offered JJ Cole after he signed his letter of intent with Iowa State um, on uh, December twenty first, uh, twenty twenty three is when he signed. Michigan offered December thirtieth. So there's a previous relationship here. He's a backup quarterback at Iowa State who's sitting behind a uh, redshirt sophomore. Okay, so he understands his playing time is very unlikely. He's a former top ten. Uh, recruit in terms of the quarterback position, uh, I believe a top 50 overall. And uh, as you can see, extremely strong arm, uh, a Jared Goff mold type of player, but with a little bit more mobility, a little bit more, as you can see in these highlights here, um, can throw on the run, strong arm, fairly accurate. Uh, This is the type of quarterback that I have talked about previously. And I'm not just throwing this guy's name out here because there's nothing to it. This is a name that is being back channeled as we speak now this doesn't mean he's coming this doesn't mean uh this is going to be the answer to compete in the fall but it does mean uh the name's being discussed so that's what i'll say there uh 
he's a name to watch with the portal. Um, and I'm not going to guarantee anything because I don't have that. But uh, I think it's very interesting. And this is the type of quarterback that I was saying the last few weeks. You want to find the highly ranked player with a lot of talent sitting behind another guy. There's tons of those in, in college football. We just have to identify them and make the connection. And we'll see what goes. We'll see where it goes from there. And then uh, I'll let, do you guys have any uh, anything you want to say on him or? Yeah, I mean, just just in terms of the, it, it, you'll know what Michigan's strategy is if, if there's portal shopping for uh, a quarterback. You know, we're not able to see the practices, but uh, you'll know it, it, how much confidence they have, and that includes Tuttle too. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Tuttle is the floor. Yeah, uh, is the floor there or not? You know, are, are we confident in it? You know, um, uh, and could a, can a player like this be better than Tuttle? That that's the question mark. So. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Cole, Cole we'll looked, uh, yeah, Cole looked um, good in the in the film here. Um, so I think uh, you know we we tend to have a quarterback come in even if he's not QB one. You know, there's been a, a trend of a transfer quarterback every year um, in like the QB two to three to four position. Now there's going to be Jack Jack Tuttle getting his seventh year of eligibility. They're they're could be two uh, with with uh, JJ Cole in the mix. So um, we, we've talked about Jack Tuttle way too much, but I, I will say that I do have this thought of Jack Tuttle as a seventh year quarterback, just beating Ohio State and then just going straight into collecting Social Security checks or something. I mean, it's just amazing if that would happen. But anyway, that, I, that's just a. Uh, th there are other dreams that are better than that, but I, that, that's just one thought I had. So it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> So, it's amazing. so uh, uh, moving on to uh, Nakai Hill Green. So very yes. interesting. He was on campus this weekend, and he was with the program, and he was doing workouts. Now, he transferred to Charlotte, but then from Charlotte, he transferred to UCF, and he had a pretty good season. He was healthy. So Michigan is um, potentially looking for depth at the linebacker position because after uh, Jay Shaw Barnum and Ernest Hausman, uh, a you got Jimmy Reuter, but Jimmy Reuter has a bit of an injury history. You also have Jaden Hood. But from what I'm understanding about the situation is they would like to potentially, if the right guy is available, add a little depth to the room. So Nikai Hill Green being on campus is very interesting to me. Um, from my understanding, what the situation is, as long as he passes through admissions and goes through – all the hoops that need to occur for him to transfer. Uh, this one might be likely, but we'll see. Um, from my understanding, it's in the early stages of discussion, and we'll uh, you know we'll kind of go there. We also know, look, the portal does not open for another six days, so technically, um, I guess uh, there's some gray area here. So we won't. Go, I don't want to go too far into things, but uh, it's a name to watch once the portal opens, in my opinion. All right. Uh, so check, keep those names uh, right handy and maybe another emerging in just the last day. We have heard that Ohio State running back Dallin Hayden has decided to enter the transfer portal. Could his relationship with Tony Alford be at the level that he may join the running back core at Michigan? TJ, I know you just heard the news before he we went live. Uh, and and all, I, I really only briefly heard a little bit that I've been running around. But um, what do you think? Uh, is there a possibility that he could come with Tony Alford uh, to, to Michigan? It's pretty would be pretty remarkable. So what's funny is like, you know, as you said, I just found out. But like I know who Dallin Hayden is, you know, because he, he actually had a fairly significant role, not this past year, but the year prior, he had over 500 yards and. I always thought he was a, a pretty talented back, um, you know, and, and looking into it a little more since we talked about it, you know, I guess I won't say I'd be surprised if it happened, but I don't think with our running back room as it is, as stacked as our running back room is, I don't think they add a running back to the room. I think when you have Donovan Edwards, you have Cleo Mullins, right? But then you have Ben Hall, you got Micah Capana, Jordan Marshall coming, you got, uh, 
Cole Cabana. I mean, the room is stacked, man. And we have the speed backs, right? So um, Hayden's kind of more of a, a twitchy speed guy. And we have a few of those in the arsenal. If it, if it happened, you know, I see he's rumored to go to Tennessee. That doesn't surprise me. That's he's from Tennessee. He's from Memphis. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Doesn't okay. surprise so that makes, me. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me at all. So and these are yeah, Buckeyes I mean, commenting. So they, they have, they know a thing or two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. About. And like, like I said, I just, I just, I just don't think they're going to add a running back to the room with the, how stacked our room is right now. So, but it's interesting. It's interesting to think about. Yeah. Uh, so he'd appear to, ha- uh, appear to have ties with Tony Alford, but, but the flip side is um, his pass blocking was kind of a question mark. At least that's the OSU reason why he didn't play as much um, as maybe some people thought that he could have. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree. The depth is uh, it's as deep as we've been really uh, uh, with running back. So uh, you know, let's see what happens. Tennessee makes more sense than Michigan. Absolutely. Um, I agree. I think Tennessee, I just wanted to have some fun with that one, but it does sound like um, I trust these Buckeyes who uh who are commenting that it's Tennessee and it it sounds it sounds right um you know based on this little bit but stay tuned you never know um don't forget we have a new Big 12 and SEC channel so go to the Big 12 channel uh right here and the SEC channel at the Voice of College Football we'll also have a Big 12 fan zone uh Thursdays 7 p.m. Eastern on the Big 12 and main channels um okay uh, so last topic here and, uh, and we'll, we'll take it to Ferris first. Um, he has been doing a breakdown, a little bit of analysis on JJ McCarthy and where he could fall and, and kind of his comparison to some of the other quarterbacks at the top level of the draft. Uh, there's rumors JJ could go as high as second to Washington. Um, I still, I still think it, 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 it could be the Vikings, um, but, uh, but, uh, Ferris, what, what, what have you been kind of looking at? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have a, a full video that's coming out in the next, uh, little while here, probably in the next 24 hours or so already recorded it, but, but we're, we're get, uh, getting it produced and, and, uh, published. Um, you know, so I compare JJ with Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, uh, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, but also with, you know, JJ is 2.0 of, uh, so a lot of people in um, New England think of him as 2.0 of Mac Jones. <laughs> and then in, of the Giants, uh, 2.0 of Daniel Jones. So so there's like, you know, there's this uh, fear that JJ is going to be like some other quarterback. Uh, you know, the flip side is Brock Purdy. You know, is JJ a, a, a Brock Purdy? So, so all of those quarterbacks, uh, every quarterback I mentioned, I went into detail in terms of what their actual stats are. Uh, And, you know, really, you know, it looks like there's three tiers, probably all in the first round, but three tiers of quarterbacks, six quarterbacks in total. So you've got Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels. Maybe that's tier one. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Drake May and J.J. McCarthy, tier two. And then you've got Michael Penix and Bo Nix, tier three. Now, what's interesting is Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, the last two Heisman Trophy winners. Um, Williams, uh, Caleb Williams is a year older than JJ. Jaden Daniels is two years older than JJ. And then Penix and Knicks are three years older than JJ. So part of this is you've got to really think through what is JJ, you know, what were these other quarterbacks like a year, two years, three years ago? And also... um, you know, just kind of think about what JJ has accomplished. He he did not play a down over age 20. He went 27 and one. He has very comparable stats to, um, you know, better stats than Drake May. I don't really understand the Dr- Drake May one because JJ has better stats than Drake May. He's the same age. He can, he can run a four or five. He can throw it 61 miles per hour. I'm not really understanding how Drake May would slip ahead of J.J. McCarthy. Penix and Knicks, you can talk about their actual stats, 
and say that they just had monster stats, you know, almost 5,000 yards for Penix, 4,500 yards for Bo Nix. I mean, these are just huge numbers in the Pac-12, but huge numbers. Um, uh, if you ch- compare JJ to Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams and JJ, you know, other than what I call the denominator, you know, number of uh, pass attempts uh, and maybe yards, you know, sort of projected, uh, but, but you know, the yards per attempt, the uh, passing efficiency rating, the touchdown to interception ratio, all of these numbers are very comparable between a Caleb Williams and a JJ McCarthy. Now you look at all this analysis and, you know, and then you, you, you look at Mac Jones, Mac Jones had 4,500 yards passing. This was in 2020. He, um, so just keep that in mind. It was a COVID year. Uh, Mac and cheese. Had, yes. He had a 203 passer rating. I mean, just an off the charts numbers, he got picked 12. I think a lot of New England fans are scared that, you know, JJ is Mac Jones. But it doesn't make sense. Mac Jones had much better stats and also kind of in those, you know, the the um, uh, the combine kind of things, JJ's better. So, and, and yeah, so, you know, and they both want a title, but it's, you know, that this is, um, it's totally apples to oranges uh, as I see it. So, I see JJ sort of in the middle of the pack of those six quarterbacks that I uh, mentioned, you know, Williams, Daniels, May, Penix, and Knicks. A- and I do think that he's better than May. So if four quarterbacks are going to be drafted, one, two, three, four, the logical place would be number three. That That's what I would say. So um interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, I've got a, it's about a 15 minute video. It'd be great if, if everyone could watch it let me know what you think but i go into detail into all their stats smash the numbers yeah. uh check it out all right tj go ahead yeah i mean i think uh you're looking at a situation where he's gonna go either third overall or number six overall um and then if if the giants want him, want him which are at number 11 they got to trade up to get him so um I think your assessment's very similar to my own. I would put JJ and and Drake May in the same category. So, um, you know, it's just what do teams, what boards do, you know, what do they have on their their big boards? You know, what team favors what? Um, I would say Drake May had a better uh, second season, though, than JJ, if you look at the numbers. But um, I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't – personally, I think JJ is probably going to Minnesota. Um, hmm. I could see him going third, though. I could see him going third overall, but I think Minnesota is going to be home, which being a Lions fan, that'll be an interesting situation. Yeah, I'm with you, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, kind of thinking in terms of what's best for JJ, it might be better if JJ slips a little bit, actually, even though we, (laughs) you know, we all like JJ. But if he slips a little bit, gets to a better team or Minnesota, gives up multiple picks to, to get up to, uh, you know, kind of in the four or five range probably is what, where they would need to get. Um, you know, maybe that's better for JJ, you know, if fitting in, uh, with a, uh, already built system is a lot better than just getting, having no offensive line and getting crushed. So, um, right. No, I agree with that. I think JJ is is better suited for a team already fairly established. I think Minnesota is a good fit with the wide receivers they have, the tight end they have, and their, their new running back they got. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I would like – shit, it's so tough because, like, as a Michigan fan, I'd like to see him in Minnesota, but as a Lions fan, I'm conflicted. I don't – because it's either one of two things. It's either one, uh, he does really well in Minnesota, and that's going to – be frustrating and as a Lions fan or the Lions are going to make his career really hard. So um, we'll see how it goes though. I mean, that, that's the life of uh, being a college football fan, but uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be, it'll be very interesting. I'm so excited for the draft too. Like I, I where I just, I can't even wait. We're like two weeks away <laughs> now, so it'll be yeah. a good time. Yeah. I, I, I love the idea of, uh, JJ to JJ, right? So that, that's what would happen in Minnesota. Uh, but yeah, that's not good for Lions fans if, if, uh, if that takes off. So uh, just a, uh, a side note, Marvin Harrison Jr., a lot of people think 
he is going to the Chargers. So that that'll be kind of interesting if if that ends up. Oh happening. man! Yeah. So the, um, Mar- Marvin Harrison Jr. joining Michigan West. That's uh, <laughs> that's really interesting. It makes sense. It does. It makes sense it, because they traded Keenan Allen. So absolutely, and he would. I mean, he would be instantly a starting wide receiver uh, connecting with Justin Herbert. So um, speaking of Minnesota, we do have Minnesota Dave, uh, who is uh, giving a 999 super chat. Um, Thank you, Minnesota Dave, for a couple of contributions today. So um, this is this is about uh, JJ Cole, I believe, uh, or JJ Cole. Uh, So do you think that Iowa would try to go after him? They need a quarterback. Everybody who was throwing water bottles after the Gopher game is a better quarterback than Iowa. <laughs> um, uh, he, he's not really that wrong. Uh, it, when when uh, check down Cade is your best option, that's that can that's a little rough. Um, uh, so yeah, what uh, th- is there any chance that uh, JJ Cole goes to Iowa? Yeah, so for people who don't know, J.J. Cole is from Iowa. So I guess that's why you would see maybe that reference. I mean, I I think, and from everything I've heard, that Iowa's going to ride with Cade next year. So I don't think Iowa's going to be in the portal shopping business, uh, the portal shopping business. So um, and even even if, all right, let's just say, let's just say hypothetically they do uh, reach out to J.J. Cole. I mean, do we honestly think J.J. Cole would rather play for Iowa than Michigan? I think Michigan's a far better option for him with a far better offensive line with a with a defense that's already championship ready, and uh, yeah. you got you got you got a, you got running backs that Iowa doesn't have tight ends. That all right, we'll give Iowa tight ends here. Uh, I don't know who their tight ends going to be next season, but I'm sure he's going to be pretty damn good because they always are. But uh, we got Colson Loveland, so Iowa can take that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Michigan's the far more appealing uh, landing spot for a quarterback like JJ Cole, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm. I guess I'm glad I'm not an Iowa fan. It, it must be so frustrating to have you know a, a good to great defense, and then if you were just moderately adequate, you know, you could definitely you know compete uh, at, at a much higher level. Uh, I mean, I guess they already you know uh, have won um, Big Ten West titles. I guess that's something, but but uh, <laughs> it's. It must be really frustrating to be an Iowa fan just to see things that one sided. So, yeah, Sean, uh, our one of our resident Buckeyes who stops by uh, Michigan Wolverines live from time to time and is also on our Ocho panel and uh, college football after dark. Um, Iowa is talking to OSU fourth stringer Lincoln Kleinholtz. Can 99% confirm? Sounds Sounds right. He he might immediately jump to the top of the list. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's what's funny about uh, like you know, how, like sometimes we complain about maybe certain things about Michigan or yeah, like when you brought up like, could you imagine being an Iowa fan? No, I could not imagine being an Iowa fan because like even being a Michigan fan, sometimes it's frustrating because we get in our own way, you know. But like, if you're an Iowa fan, holy, like your offense can't score, like. Damn, and you don't even have the potential. I mean, you. Could, I mean, maybe they could have a year where their team is ex- like very, very elite. You know, that seems to happen every four to five years where it's really, really good. But at least with Michigan, it's so it's such a big brand, and there's so many resources that even though Michigan gets in its own way, it's still a competitive ass team. Uh, even with all of our hurdles that we have to jump over, I mean, Iowa. Like, I just I couldn't even fathom being a fan of an Iowa or. A, or like a Northwestern or an Illinois or an Indiana, like Jesus. Dude. I tough. was kind of rooting. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of rooting for Iowa uh, a little like compared to others um, as like a second secondary, um, you know, in part because uh, uh, Erica and uh, Casey Mallory and all them are, I'm, I'm, I'm tight with all them. So like I wanted, I wanted it to work out. And then of course I, made the boneheaded prediction that uh, that Iowa was going to beat Penn State at Happy Valley, um, which which really didn't happen. And um, and so they let me down, uh, but they still had a pretty solid season given the uh, the offensive struggles um, last mm-hmm. year. So just a quick side note, I believe Iowa 
plays in the Rose Bowl against UCLA or one of the LA teams. Um, uh, I fully expect to th- that to be an Iowa takeover um, uh, in the stadium there. You know, I, I think people are going to do vacations and, and go over there. And I think a lot of the traditional Big Ten teams um, with the opportunity to go West Coast, people are, people are going to plan vacations around it. And the lukewarm interest with some of these uh, West Coast teams, well, the two LA teams, but uh, um, UCLA in particular, um, people want to go to the Rose Bowl. I, th- I think I think people, uh, you, know, you could see stadium takeovers when when that happens. Yeah, I would say that's that's probably a high probability because they can't even get their own fans to show up for any game. So that'll be interesting to see. Absolutely. All right. Well, y'all, uh, like I said, thanks for holding down the fort last week. Um, really appreciated that uh, while I was uh, running around Las Vegas. Um, Ferris, we'll start with you for uh, for a final thought. And uh, where can people find you? Definitely check out the Smash the Numbers series, a uh, brand new series uh, going over analytics here at Michigan Football at the Voice of College Football Channel. All right. Yeah. So I'm doing everything I can to get our, the number of our subscribers to be ahead of Ohio state. So I, so I know we talked about this at the very beginning here, uh, trying to produce content, uh, approximately every week. This is labor intensive. I do go into numbers in, in a lot of detail and I share it. Hopefully, um, uh, there are others that share that interest, try to be, you know, hopefully this could make you become a more informed fan appreciate any feedback. If, if I have a blind spot, let me see what, what that blind spot is with respect to, to some of this. So the latest video will be on uh, JJ versus five other, uh, the five other top quarterbacks and where he should be, you know, uh, uh, where he should be drafted. So um, that's where you can reach me. You can also reach me at uh, Bobblehead Guru on uh, Instagram or TikTok. Thank you. There you go. Thanks, Ferris. Go blue. Go blue. Yeah. All right, TJ. Yeah. So uh, if you want to follow me, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, uh, Ronan Sports Talk. Uh, I'm always looking forward to new people following and and more conversation on some of the posts I make or or other dialogue going on. So that you know that's always interesting. And and guys, we are 200 subscribers away from 7,000. So if, if you're watching this, you're not subscribed. You know. Please subscribe. Please, please hit that uh, bell button so we can get all of our videos. We got a bunch of content coming, right? And uh, you know, we really, really want to surpass Ohio State because then it's just another, it's another badge that we can just uh, talk more shit to them. But um, yeah, good show, good show, John. Uh, missed you last week. Mark held it down, and he did. Uh, you know, uh, it was, it's always a good time talking with you and Ferris, man. Likewise, TJ, thanks Thanks for being here. Thanks for making a great addition, you and Ferris both, to uh, to the show. And uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, TJ. All right, John. Go Blue. Go Blue. Okay. Uh, so we thank all of them. Uh, make sure to hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Like, uh, like he said, it is very important that we beat Ohio State. Okay. For those people who do not want to hear a eulogy to a dog, now is the time to hit the X button. If you came here just for the Michigan football content and you do not want to hear about a dog, now is the time is the time where you can hit the X button. Um, I'm giving you the warning so people aren't like, "What the hell is this?" Okay, so um, on Sunday morning. Uh, the world lost an incredible beacon of light who made everybody who met him um, made their day a little bit happier. Uh, Gizmo was my, not just my dog, he was my companion in life. Uh, Friends come and go, girlfriends came and went, Gizmo was there through seven years, seven years um, since he was rescued. And he was rescued uh, by this incredible organization here 
uh, City Dogs Rescue and City Kitties of Washington, D.C. So I'm taking this opportunity. Um, anybody who would like to consider donating or like giving, contributing in any way uh, due to this, um, I would ask that you donate to this, this organization because without them, I never would have met Gizmo. And um, so he, he, for seven years, we went through DC together. We went through Florida together and he met my mom. He met my brother uh, and, and they fell in love with him too. I told, I told them that they would, uh, you know, and they, they definitely did right away. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's tough. Uh, you know, he, he was suffering with bronchitis the last month, uh, kind of off and on. Uh, we had him on all the meds, everything else, uh, but he he fought as hard as he could. Um, but he he, uh, he he got pneumonia uh, and he passed. Um, so he he waited till I came back from Vegas in one last act of uh, of of uh, being loyal and incredible. He waited. He wanted to wait, and he gave me one last day uh, Friday night into Saturday. Um, where we just had a normal day and we just hung out and I'm glad that he gave me that. And I'm grateful to him for that. Um, he, he went down, uh, it, 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 it ended pretty rapidly. Um, Saturday night into Sunday morning, uh, he was coughing a lot. I took him to the hospital. Um, he passed pretty quickly. Um, he, he spared me from that agonizing decision of what to do, uh, because he made the decision for us. Um, another thing we're grateful to him for, but, uh, some of you may remember him from the shows. Uh, you know, occasionally he would stop by the voice of college football and, uh, and be a guest star on the voice of college football, uh, the Ocho, especially cause I do more relaxed show for the Ocho. So sometimes he'll come by, he'll want to give his two cents on whatever the big 10 news of the day was. Um, just an incredible dog and, um, seven years with the dog is really something. So I do ask, uh, so city dogs rescue, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this incredible organization. They rescue dogs, uh, in unfortunate situations, abandonment. Um, uh, you know, they, they save them from euthanasia, um, and, and find homes, find places for these animals, um, that are suitable. So they, they actually, um, they did three references. So, so I had to give three references and then they did, so they checked all the references. They did a home visit. That's right, folks, a home visit to check and make sure that the home was suitable for the dog. Okay. So these people are no joke. It's, it, it, I, I, I always used to joke. It was like getting a it's like getting a mortgage or getting a, you know, like a, adopting a kid. I mean, that's what it felt like. But, um, but the, you know, the process is there to make sure that, uh, that they have good homes with loving parents. Um, and, uh, and so that's what they do. And it's a great thing that they do. So, uh, so if you can spare a few dollars um, and you did want to give back for whatever reason, uh, that's where I would ask that it go um, because they do, they do incredible work. So Gizmo, uh, you know, he's not suffering anymore. He's in a, he, he is, uh, he, he is no longer in pain. He's no longer coughing. He's no longer dealing with this. And, uh, and, and I, I just am so thankful to him for seven years. So, uh, so that's, that's the show today. Um, we do want to ask everybody to, uh, consider going over to the USC channel in about a half hour for Trojan Conquest Live, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Mark Rogers, Matt Zemick, Tim Prangley, they do a fantastic job over there uh, talking about uh, USC football and the news of the day. Um, so so it, is, it is coming in just a little bit here. I'm going to put the link right here so, uh, so everybody can just go ahead and, and stop by. And uh, check it out. Uh, give him a hit the like button for him, and and tell him John sent you. Would you tell him John sent you? Because uh, we want to make sure that they do well. Uh, because when it, when when people in our Voice of College Football Network do well, 
uh, then that's just a great thing. So, um, so with that said, my name's John Diadamo. I was your host for the last uh, hour and a half. Um, go ahead and follow me on Twix at John Diadamo. Um, I will next be on Monday night for the Big Ten Live Ocho edition, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, so, so I'll see you then. Um, like I said, consider donating to City Dogs Rescue. And this episode was dedicated to Gizmo. I know he's a dog. I get it. But trust me, if you met him, you'd know. You'd know why I'm doing it. All right, y'all. Um, go blue and see you next time.